the church as seen by the prophets of the Old Testament. We emphasized how that the church is a prepared place. It was not an afterthought in God's mind because the Jews would not receive Christ as their king, and so God just sort of interjected it as a stopgap measure. We realized in the study of the terms referring to the institution of the redeemed that the church or the kingdom, the body of Christ, all are terms referring to the same institution. We need to understand that down through the years that the Bible covers, that is the happenings of the Bible, that God was preparing for the church to come into the world. And there's much said about Jesus Christ in prophecy in the Old Testament, but there is much said about the church that he said he would build in Matthew 16, 18, in the Old Testament too. There are certain prophets that spoke concerning the Old Testament, or rather the uh, church, and we started looking at those last week. I'll go back over the prophets that spoke, none of them that did the writing ever wrote until after the kingdom was divided. And we noted Joel last week is the first one that wrote about the church, but then there's Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. The emphasis that Joel gave to his prophecies of the church was that it had to do with the church coming in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thus, Peter quoted about the events happening on the day of Pentecost, as Luke records in Acts 2 in Jerusalem, as this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And uh, Joel 2.28 is referenced. So emphasis I give here to the fact that the church is a very important institution. It is as important as Christ because it is his spiritual body, and it, does, it would not and could not exist without the Christ having done what he did. It figures as much into the scheme of the redemption of mankind as does Jesus Christ. In Paul's writing in Ephesians 4, when he says that there is one God and one Lord and one Spirit, he also says there's one body. In Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, verse 18, he defines that one body to be the church. So we see as we look at the prophets and their work concerning the Messiah, we see their work also concerning the church. And when the scripture says this is that which was spoken by a prophet, and then the Holy Spirit is guiding the one to say this is that, then there is a divine commentary on the passage referenced as was done by Peter in Acts chapter 2.16 concerning the prophecies that Joel made. And it shall come to pass, Joel 2, 28, afterward, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And we read Acts 2 and see Luke's inspired account of the miraculous events that really signal to the people that God is doing all of this. And that the word these apostles are preaching is not from men, men, but from heaven. Because they were speaking, as Luke records, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Thus, as the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth, Christ, via the Holy Spirit, delivered the apostles' doctrine. The church knew that because it continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. Now, why would they do that? Because they understood the way God was revealing the will of Christ to this earth so that man would know how to become Christians. Men would know in that church to which he added all those who were baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38, having first believed in Christ by the gospel being preached to them and repenting of their sins, that they would be able to live godly lives, that is, be faithful to Christ, as the redeemed in his spiritual body 
which is the church. So the Lord's church had been ushered in by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And in doing so, Joel's prophecy started to be fulfilled. There were a number of years without the completed revelation of the New Testament and it being written down that the church existed. How was it to live faithful to Christ, seeing that faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, if it doesn't have the Word of God pertaining to the church written down so they can read it? Well, thus the miraculous element was in the church. And you have listed nine miraculous gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that came through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And the apostles possessed all of them plus one. They could impose their hands on a member of the church and impart a miraculous gift to them. And when those miraculous gifts were used as God intended in a church without a completed New Testament, then they would have the wherewithal to be faithful as the New Testament was being revealed. So we then leave Joel and we come down then to Amos. He, of course, is another one of the, we call minor prophets, remembering that minor means their works were uh, shorter and the major prophets being their works were longer. He was a prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel. His name means burden or burden bearer. And he prophesied at Bethel. In class this morning, we noticed the location of Bethel on the map. And that was in about 775 B.C. He was a prophet just after the time of Obadiah, Joel, and Jonah. And just before Hosea, Micah, and Isaiah. This man was a country prophet. In fact, many would consider him, if they had some formal education of that day, a country bumpkin. And he makes it clear that the only reason he's doing the work that he is doing is because God called me to do it. He gives you the idea in no uncertain terms, it's been left up to me to do just what I do. I would have stayed down there in Tekoa, which is about 12 and a half miles southeast of Jerusalem, and I would have dealt with the flocks and the herds. And it says he was a dresser, a dresser and I ask you to look this up, you probably forgot it of the King James spelling is sycamore tree. Well, that is called a sycamine tree. And it's a tree that favors, notice I say favor, one of these live oaks out here. Doesn't get that big, but it favors it. And it's got little figs all over it. Now, how do you know that? Well, I was told that's what that was when I was in Israel. And it had little figs all over it. And the only way that you got them to ripen was to either pinch the ends of them or poke a stick in the end of them like a toothpick. Then they would ripen. Well, I'm helping a little bit to understand what a dresser of sycamine trees uh, would be when I see that. They taste about like a fig. But anyway, that's what he did along with other things that folks who lived close to the land had to do. And he was quite content to do that. Have you ever noticed that a farmer who really loves farming doesn't really want to do anything else and doesn't want to be bothered and uh, that's sort of the way I feel about it. Uh, having married into a farmer's family, I can guarantee you that's the way they are. I think Jody's daddy loved his farming about as much as, as anything. But anyway, this was the account of his background. So he was a country prophet. And he was called to prophesy against Jeroboam, who was the king in Israel. And we might say, and prophesy, he did. Sometimes um, we will say to young preachers, if you're going to really be a preacher like God wants you to be in the proclamation and defense of the gospel, do not stay long away from the prophets. Now, when you decide to preach like they preach the message of truth that is the gospel today, you might as well be prepared to receive what they received also. But nevertheless, that's been characteristic of all those who were faithful to God, whether the Old or the New Testaments. Amos 9, verses 11 through 12. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. 
I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Well, we said something about the prophets, which we try to emphasize all the time, whether it's the New Testament or the Old Testament. They wrote in the culture and society in which they lived. And if we're to understand the words and terms they use as God by the Holy Spirit caused them to apply them to the Messiah or to the church, then we have to understand how those words were understood by them. And so it is when time you're studying your Bible, it's a part of rightly dividing or handling or right the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Amos saw the church as the restored tabernacle of David. So here we see another picture of the Lord's church. He's preparing the people to understand it. We see the outpouring of the Spirit through Joel. That would characterize the coming of the church. And now we see the church is the restored tabernacle of David. Now the tabernacle, <clears throat> especially Moses' tabernacle, was a common object of reference in the days in which Amos lived. For Amos to speak of the church by the symbol of the tabernacle, which literally means tent, as it was originally when they left Mount Sinai in their wilderness wanderings, it was one of those terms that was interwoven into the Hebrew language. The case was that the tabernacle of David, as he said, which had been breached or broken down, was the united kingdom of Israel. It's interesting in taking note of Solomon, and Jeff referred to this some time ago, Solomon, as the scripture says, married many foreign wives. Now, foreign here doesn't just mean outside the country, though that covers them, covered them. But it also means foreign to the whole way of life of God's people. The law, and conduct, and so forth. And they had turned Solomon's heart away from God to the worshiping of idols. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. And he had 700 wives, princes, and 300 porcupines. No, he doesn't say that. Concubines. <laughs> I think you can say that they turned into porcupines. Besides that, you're getting sleepy and I need to do something to get your attention. And his wives turned away his heart. Now, that ought to say something to us, folks. Just think of what I said this morning. And his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Why, he was a great man. God had blessed him with wisdom because he asked for it, and then gave him also great wealth. And people came from far and wide to hear the wisdom of Solomon his Queen of Sheba came, says, a half has never yet been told. Referring to his wisdom. And so we turn that into a song. And the half has never yet been told. God warned Solomon that he would surely rend the kingdom from him. But Solomon, this very wise man, did not listen to God. So God raised up adversaries against Solomon to deter him from his idolatrous course but well, Solomon continued in his insolence and his disobedience so it is in time God calls the prophet Ahijah now, this is not Elijah this is Ahijah to anoint Jeroboam as king of the ten northern tribes now we don't have time to go into the background of Jeroboam uh, Jeff did that some in a sermon just recently but it's very interesting to see how God is providential workings was setting everything up to take care of matters because Solomon did as he did, but he even provided for Jeroboam to be acceptable to him. And Jeroboam was just about the same as Solomon when it came to stubbornness to have his own way and do his own thing and to accrue all the power that he could get. 
the way men view success. Only Judah, which was the much larger of the tribes, and then the little tribe of Benjamin remained to form the southern kingdom of Judah. So, the prophet Amos saw the tabernacle of David raised up as in the days of old. The breaches thereof were closed. Division between Israel and Judah, in other words, was closed up. Now in the Jewish mind who could not see beyond the Messiah being a king greater than Solomon on an earthly throne, and that the people of Israel under the law would dominate the world, thus that was their view of the Messiah when Christ came, which was erroneous. When they saw things like this, they limited it strictly to the Jews. They were still doing that when Christ came. They were still doing that when he established the church. So it would take a great deal of work to get some things turned around and no little persecution of the Lord's church. Further, Amos saw the restored nation as it proceeded to possess the remnant of Edom. You know, these all go back to the days of Esau, so there's a bloodline there that connects. And all the nations that were called by the name of the Lord. In other words, the great commission to preach the gospel to every creature wasn't limited to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. It was meant to go to every creature under heaven. Now the Jews just didn't have any idea about that. The days of Christ, even the apostles didn't understand. Take Peter, for example, in Acts 10, that the gospel was to be preached to uncircumcised Gentile. It took a special miracle, the household of Cornelius, to get the church to see that the gospel was to be preached to everybody. Now some years after the establishment then of the Lord's church, in Acts chapter 2, Jews, once the church had Gentiles added to it when they obeyed the gospel, began to say, well, yeah, you can be saved, but you've got to be circumcised to keep the law. Now, Paul and Barnabas, when that false doctrine got to Antioch in Syria, uh, just to put it nicely, uh, had very heated discussions in refuting it. So the decision was made, let's go down to Jerusalem, or go up to Jerusalem where these things were came from, and let's see where it all came from. And so in Acts 15, you find that they had discussion on all of this. So in Jerusalem, they realized that while the Gentiles were to be accepted, but they didn't have to be circumcised. It's beginning to dawn on these people that this church is something totally different from the Mosaical system. It took a while for that to happen. Because this is at the stage where the New Testament is being revealed in part and parcel into the world over a period of years. And people are having to develop. There would be a time when it would be finished. Paul looked forward to that day as he mentions in the last few verses, 1 Corinthians 13. It's amazing how people, to me, oh, if we could just have miracles today. Paul says, we got them. I'm looking for a completed New Testament. Perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. It's, it left the people, we always get it backwards. So in all that time when miracles and miraculous gifts were in the church, the apostles walked the earth, they yearned for a completed New Testament. In Acts 5, 13 through 18, or Acts 15, and after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me, hearken unto me. Simon, that's Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it's written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I'll set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord, who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all His works. Now, I might not understand the application of Amos 9, 
verses 11 through 12, except that I've got an inspired commentary through James and Acts 15 saying what's happening here at the house of Cornelius that all uncircumcised Gentiles have a right to the gospel just like the Jews. This is a fulfillment of Amos 9. Now the Holy Spirit, and time doesn't mean anything to the Holy Spirit because He's God, inspired Amos to say those things. And the Holy Spirit down in the days of James in Jerusalem inspired James to say these things. So time makes no difference. Here's what's said and here's how it's applied. So I've got a divine guidance here. I don't have to wonder. I have God telling me how it's applied. Then you had a lot of questioning that went on in that conference. Peter reported how that God had made that choice when by his mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That God in turn gave them the Holy Spirit, thus bearing witness that they were acceptable to God like anybody else in belief and obedience of the gospel. So we then see the tabernacle of David. Now what could it be? It's the church whereby all men are reconciled to God when they believe and obey from the heart that form of doctrine, the gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and being baptized. All of this said over years to get us to understand the church is the spiritual body of Christ. This is how God's going to build up everything and put it all back together. It's not the United Nations. It's not the government in Washington or Austin or any other human government anywhere else. It's not through the philosophies of men. It's through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glad tidings of Christ, the power of God to save men from sin. That's how everybody is reconciled to God. Everyone, anywhere, at any time, who will believe the gospel of Christ and obey it in being baptized into Christ are reconciled to God, justified in His sight, saved from their sins, and they're all one in Christ Jesus. Now you can't get any more at one than that. Nothing else is to interrupt or bother or destroy or fracture that unity that comes about through submission to God's will. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 That's how the church is kept unified. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Those commandments, that authority is revealed in the New Testament and only in the New Testament. Yet it was all prepared for all through the days of the Old Testament, even as the prophets are saying. And we just noticed Joel, and now we notice Amos. So there is a factual material, the Bible being the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation of God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that tells us how that breach is filled, how the walls are made complete, how unity takes place. Folks, there can be no unity among those who believe in Christ when we do not walk according to the authorized will of Christ. And the only place I know that authorized will is found is in His infallible Word the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God. And you can say also the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And why is that the case? For the word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why the word must be preached. The word will cut to the very core of a human being. And if he's honest, he'll see his needs and he'll see where those needs are met and he will understand it's in Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. To be outside of Christ is not to be a partaker of all God's blessings. There are things, sinner and saint, all enjoy from God. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Uh, we have all sorts of things like that. People don't realize that atheists declaring there is no God or benefiting from the grace of God in this life. 
But they won't benefit from the forgiveness of sins, being justified in God's sight, reconciled to God, and a child of God, except they believe and obey the gospel. And that's the reason it must be preached to every creature. It's free moral agents that gives us the opportunity to hear it, to understand it, to honestly receive it, or to reject it. So the point is, the prophets knew all of this. And just these two prophets were able to see that God would make it plain when His church would be established because it would be characterized by the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Miracles would be worked. You'd know it's God's will that was preached because no man can do these things as was said of, by Nicodemus of Jesus except God be with him. We're led now to Isaiah and Micah and I want to consider them together because they both worked at about the same time, as best we can figure out. Isaiah, of course, was one of the four prophets who was one of the major prophets. He, uh, he was from the southern kingdom. Isaiah means Jehovah, or God is salvation. Isaiah has been called by various ways, if you pick up different commentaries, the Paul of the Old Testament, the Shakespeare, the prophets, the Evangel, Evangel I say it in Greek, Euangelistes, the evangelist of the prophets. A long ministry of about 60 years was his to fulfill somewhere in 750 give or take some years so he walked the earth that many years before Jesus Christ did and his ministry lasted some 40 years and it spanned the reign of four kings Isaiah was a contemporary at least we think so of the prophet Hosea and Micah they were working in the northern kingdom Micah was one of 12 minor prophets. He worked in the northern kingdom. His name means who is like God. His prophecies range from the mid-70s down to roughly 700 or something like that. He was a contemporary of Hosea in the northern kingdom of Israel and with Isaiah in the southern kingdom of Judah. These two great prophets of Judah, and this is the point we want to make before we close foresaw the church of our Lord as a house established on the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills here again the vision turned on a familiar object a house and it didn't mean the dwelling place it meant a family the household of Cornelius in Acts 10 was the family of Cornelius and all involved in that family each of the prophets, Isaiah, in Isaiah 2, 2, and 3, and Micah, some years later, and Micah 4, 1 through 2, announced, remember this is around 750 years before Jesus walked this earth. Now it shall come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He's going to teach us his ways there, and we'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. One of the first sermons I ever preached that I can remember, and you know, at one time I thought I never would say that. Going back 53 years or so, I can now say that about some things. I remember doing it, but I don't remember where I did it. And I remember preaching it, but I don't remember the first time I preached it or where it was. But this is one of them I preached a lot back in those days. Pointing out, now just when was the church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, started? Well, I would take Isaiah 2, 2, and 3 and Micah, and I would notice that it would be the word of the Lord go forth from Jerusalem. That out of Zion would go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I would take other scriptures, but I primarily take that and say, now when you come all the way up to Acts 2, stuff like this is said about the church, but it's all future tense. 
But then when I leave Acts 2, I find out it's spoken of as his existence. And thus, there's been a book written, the hub of the Bible, saying that Acts chapter 2 is the hub of the Bible. Everything about the church before that is spoken of in future tense. After that, it's in present reality. So what does that say about what happened in Jerusalem starting at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning on that Pentecost of long ago? The church started. All that had was said about it in the Old Testament came to bear, and that institution started. When Isaiah and Micah spoke of the house of the Lord, the concept, remember, it was rooted in what they used regularly. This stuff was for their understanding as far as it could go at this point because all the prophecies aren't turned in yet. Many years yet lay ahead. More prophets are to speak. But for what they were saying, they could understand what the house of the Lord was. And we learn then in James 1 in verse 25 that uh, the house of the Lord is the church of the living God. So you find inspiration commenting on inspiration. One to define the other. One to explain the other. That's God saying, I said that back here. Now you want to know what I meant? Well, let me tell you right here what I meant. And it's amazing to me in the right division of the word, people can't see that. But we don't. So when they spoke of the house as being established on the top of the mountains, that concept of was that the church uh, would occupy the most exalted position of any institution on the earth. Yet to hear the devil's work among the denominations founded and sustained by the commandments and doctrines of men, the church plays no part in your salvation. None. The church is not essential to salvation. You believe personally on Jesus Christ and ask Him to come into your heart, and then you pick a church of your choice. I can't find any idea like that manifest in the prophets, nor more particularly and plainly set out regarding the church in the New Testament. It doesn't exist. But that's what the devil would do, don't you think? Don't you think he would take the truth on whatever topic that pertains to the salvation of men and he would say it means something else. So when people are converted to Christ and all that that means, they must understand that the church of the living God is the house of God. It's the family of God. God the Father only has children in his family unlike ungodly men. They are begotten by God through the Word, sown in the heart of men. And if they're honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15, they'll believe it. And they'll do whatever it requires of them in order to be saved from their sins by Jesus Christ. And when they're obedient to the gospel and being baptized, they're born of water and the Spirit into the family of God. You know, as far as I know, and I'll be a bit facetious here, facetious here to make my point. When God created my spirit, he didn't say, pick which family on earth you want to be a child in. No, we didn't know anything about it. But when mom and daddy engaged in the law of procreation, God created David Brown's spirit, put it in the body, and I was born into that family. I was added to it. That's exactly how you get into the family of God. You're not saved and then you choose which family you want to get in. When you obey the gospel as it appears on the pages of your New Testament, in being baptized into Christ, you're born of water and the Spirit. The Spirit tells you plainly what Jesus said one must do in order to be saved. And thus, when you comply with it, you're born of water and the Spirit, and the Lord adds you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. And in that church, all who've done likewise, your brothers and sisters in the family of God, you organize like the New Testament said you'd organize, you worship like the New Testament says you're to worship, you live your daily lives like the Lord through the New Testament teaches you to live as a child of God. And someday, all of God's singers will get home and there won't be a one of them there since the church has been established that's accountable to God that didn't get there through the family of God, the church. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. I think I misquoted the passage while I go on that. But 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And the beginning of that verse, Paul said to Timothy, If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. Oh, lo and behold, there's a certain way you've got to live in the church. How to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So it is that the prophets saw this, and they spoke of how all nations would flow to it. The concept was that a steady stream of men and women, whether Jews or Gentiles, would flow into the house of God, which is the church of the living God. When they spoke of how that many people shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord. The concept was that the church would be characterized by a zealous evangelistic program. Each one who was saved by the gospel taught to them would be anxious to teach that gospel to someone else who's lost. When they spoke of how God would teach us His ways and we shall walk in His paths, the concept was that the church would be characterized by a dedicated program of spiritual edification. And when they spoke of how that for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, the idea was that the church would have its beginning in the city of Jerusalem, as I said earlier. Any church beginning before that time in the city of Jerusalem is not the church Jesus shed his blood to purchase. It's not the church he built. And the same is true of any church starting after what's recorded in Acts 2. The fact remains that the apostles were assembled in Jerusalem, as Joel pointed out, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them in the baptismal measure, Acts 2. It can truthfully be said that this marked the beginning of the blood-bought, spirit-filled institution, the church of the living God. Both Isaiah and Micah also spoke of the peaceful, non-militant attitude which would pervade the hearts and lives of those who flow to it. Now, when I say non-militant, I mean the idea you take swords and spears or guns and rifles and convert people in that way. The idea is that you live peaceful lives. That doesn't mean you compromise the truth. Doesn't mean that you change it to fit what somebody else thinks. But it means that when you live like the New Testament teaches you to live, uh, they'll beat their swords and their plowshares and their spears and their pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up na a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. It won't be like Israel of old that had to fight carnally for its existence. But it'll be a peaceful institution ruled by the Prince of Peace, the king over his kingdom, the church. Isaiah also saw how that within God's house, he would give a memorial. He would give an everlasting name, Isaiah 56, 5. Even to them I will give my, in my house and within my walls a place and a name. Better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name. They shall not be cut off. Sounds like a place I'd like to be. The place or memorial of which Isaiah spoke was instituted by none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark describes the event in the night of our Lord's betrayal in Mark 14, verses 22 through 25. Mark uh, said as they were eating, Jesus took bread, he blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. He said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Surely I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I'll take of it in my Father's kingdom. Now they were observing the Lord's Supper as is recorded in Acts 20 and verse 7. What does that do to the idea of the kingdom is yet in our future? For the Lord said, I won't do this again until I drink it with you in the Father's kingdom. But they were drinking of it and partaking of it in the first century in the church. Which means then the church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church. And there is no kingdom yet ahead of us to be established on this earth. Isaiah also saw that it would be a weekly observance of that memorial. In Isaiah 63, 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another. And from one Sabbath to another. Now that's once each week or between one Sabbath and another Sabbath. 
All flesh, that's Jews and Gentiles, shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The memorial of which Isaiah spoke is observed by faithful Christians every Lord's Day in God's house, the church. The everlasting name which was to be given within the walls of God's house is the name Christian. He prophesied, Isaiah did in 62, 1 and 2, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness, and her salvation is a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will name. Well, it appears that the chief point of this prophecy is that of the everlasting name. But that wasn't to be given until the Gentiles had seen the righteousness of God. And Gentiles didn't see that righteousness till Peter spoke the gospel to Cornelius' house. So when the people on Pentecost were baptized to Christ, those were Jews and proselytes. Proselyte was a Gentile who said, I want to be like the Jews, but he was circumcised. He was accepted different from what the Jews did, which was no acceptance at all of the uncircumcised Gentiles. Well, they went on then to the Samaritans after Jerusalem and Judea with the gospel. But after the conversion of Cornelius and his household, we read in Acts eleven twenty six, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, if you study the circumstances of Antioch, you'll see that prophets were there. And you'll see in the grammar of uh, 66.23 in Isaiah that this is an official naming. It wasn't accidental naming or name given in derision. It was the mouth of the Lord shall name. The apostle Paul was there. Barnabas, a prophet, was there. And other prophets were there. And the only thing you can conclude is that God by the Holy Spirit says individual members of my family will be called Christians. Isaiah further saw how that all nations and tongues would come into the house of Jehovah. Jehovah would take for priests and Levites from them. Isaiah 66, 18 through 21. Well, he couldn't do that under the law. But he could, even as he had a high priest of the tribe of Judah, who was Christ over the church. He couldn't be a high priest under the law, but he's high priest for us today, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, and then we'll be through. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, a peculiar people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were no people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So Peter wrote to our brethren, members of the family of God almost 2,000 years ago, and if you have from the heart obeyed the gospel of Christ, you are a child in the family of God. I hope we'll realize the value of these prophets even more as we go through the rest of them as to what they bring to us if we rightly divide the word of truth in the Old Testament concerning the church that Jesus shed his blood to purchase. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you as we've studied to become a Christian by obedience to the gospel. As a child of God, if you have sinned, the second law of pardon is repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to obey the truth and be saved by your God, we invite you to do so as we stand and sing this song.